So um, welcome everybody, as Seppi said, to um, the British Cartographic Society Conference 2022. Um, I'm Claire Selden, Associate at STEER, um, also um, British Cartographic Society Council member since November. And um, with that um, responsibility comes great things. Um, I volunteered and got involved with Programme Committee to um, help host the conference this year with obviously the support of my steer colleagues um, and the company. So um, we were thinking about what themes we wanted to do. And um, I just said, you know, our team is actually called Design for Movement. And um, it can be quite a broad um, theme then, and it might work quite well. Um, and so that's that's kind of where it was all born from back in at the beginning of the year. So um, I also do all the social media for the society, for the British Cartographic Society. So um, if there's ever anything that you want to share um, online by Twitter, Facebook, Instagram or LinkedIn or our YouTube channel, then do get in touch with me um, and I'm sure I can help you with that. Um, so back to the GeoViz um, workshop. Um, today, on this, um, I'm going to be covering some work of my work in Map Publisher and talking about some of the things that I've done to improve my workflow. So I'm very pleased to share with everybody that I've just been published in the Map Projection Collection um, cards by um, Daniel Huffman in the US. Um, he asked people a few months ago, well, it must have been back in April, May time, to uh, if they would be in, interested in getting involved in a project to create some trading cards um, of all different map projections, global map projections. Um, I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, we're all a bit nerdy and a bit like collecting things. And obviously with maps on it, why not? Um, and so my map that I'm going to be talking about today, a little bit, it's a bit bright, isn't it? I'll go see it very well. Um, is my, um, is an azimuthal equidistant map, which I've done quite a few of maps like this um, at Steer over the years um, for global flight data. Um, and it's something that I, I think is really valuable using that projection and, and the, you know, generally using different projections. So I'm going to be talking a bit about how that map um, came to be and how to create your own bespoke azimuthal map projection and then also looking at um, themes and styles in map publisher um, to develop maps in a non-destructive workflow so um, a lot of the time in illustrator um, using map publisher plugin we it's very easy in illustrator to delete things and move things around um, and do things the way you just use the data that you want um, selecting filters and things like that and, and getting rid of the data that you don't want but then often you're like, oh, actually, I want to bring that back in or do something different or style it differently or select a different data set. And because the data is not linked directly through the GIS, um, that data has gone. It's, you know, you have to re-import it again. Um, so I've been looking at ways to um, import data and style data um, in a non-destructive workflow. So meaning not deleting it, not... Um, erasing it from the file or um, going over and over things with groups and, and trying to get away a little bit from you, from the default illustrator um, sort of things that we rely on as sort of designers used to that, that side of it, which is a great thing, but then just trying to use my publisher to its full advantage. Um, hopefully by the end of this, then we'll be able, you will be able to adapt a map projection yourself um, and know the parameters to use to do that within map publisher which again is universal across all gis um, systems um, you'll be able to use know how to use some themes and how to import import some large data um, more easily than um, illustrator tends to uh, crash if you have if you import these large data sets which nowadays um, big data is a big thing and um, can sometimes struggle with um, importing that kind of stuff so um i think hopefully that's everybody in that we're waiting for now um henry do you know if there's anybody else left in the thing that liz is assigning i think liz is assigning the last few but there's not money in there now so 
Cool. Yeah. Okay. Good to go. Good job. Thank you. Right, we'll carry on then. So um, the way I've set this up is um, a presentation. I've got about 30 slides. I've split it up into two sections. So the first section is um, talking about this flight map, the azimuthal equidistant um, map of Doha that I've created. Um, so talking about the projections and how to change a projection and then the data that I used to create that map so you could create it yourself. Um, we'll have a go at creating a similar one. And then the second section is about base map styling. So using the um, themes in Map Publisher, um, styling themes and um, looking at geo packages and, and importing large data. And we've got, um, so I'll be flitting between this presentation as a structure and um, live demos in Illustrator and QGIS um, from that. So first of all, the flight map. So at STEER, we create um, maps of all kinds of just different transport and people and places and cities um, uh, internationally, um, not just in the UK. We've got, we've got 22 offices around the world um, and we're often called on. Um, so the team in London, who uh, more people will be talking tomorrow, got Ollie Russell and Tim Goss um, doing presentations tomorrow as well. And our um, managing director, Lisa, Martin will be talking at the beginning of the session tomorrow to introduce Steer. Um, and we're in the UK called upon um, throughout our offices and regions to support them in project work. Um, but we've also got other colleagues in the local offices to support us as well. So as I mentioned already, um, this particular, I'll come back to this at the end as well, this particular um, map um, has now been published as part of the projection collection um, and trading cards. And I was really hoping that they would arrive and they only arrived on Saturday. So I was a bit like, oh, my gosh, that's really great. So there's 77 of these um, trading cards. They've all got like um, information on the back as to the class and um, properties, the parameters um, that they are. And then there's like beautiful little codes in the corner that you can match them up with. So um, if you want to know more about those, do search um, Projection Collection on Twitter. You'll find lots of people um, talking about them and share, sharing them. If there's anybody else in the UK that has them, let me know because I'm up for swapsies, um, but they cost quite a lot um, to get back over to the US. So I'm trying not to send them back from where they came over the US, um, over the pond if I can help it and get other people to in the UK to do some sorts of first. So um, I'll show you those at the end. So as I said, we're used to these kind of projections. Um, this is a standard Mercator projection. This is something that we've that we use for points and um, general overview maps. Um, obviously at Steer, these, these are kind of our marketing ones. That's kind of what we were used to. They're fine for points and labeling like that. I haven't got a problem with that projection for particular needs, um, quickness, familiarity, um, simple understanding of places and, and um, locations. So, you know, it's not the it's not the cartographer's dream projection. Um, some of, uh, mostly all of these ones are in, in the card collection, but um, it does its job um, and, and it's, that's fine for that kind of thing. So um, going forward, we were sort of looking at other projects, um, other work at Steer that we were producing and started looking at, okay, so we're doing this um, flight or connections um, mapping for uh, an airport in uh, New Zealand. And again, this, is, this was produced over 10 years ago, I think now. Um, and the only change we did was using the projection, you know, centering it. Um, on Australasia, Australasia there, so that you could see all those things together rather than obviously if it was in the projection like the previous one, you'd end up splitting um, the map and the routes across. So that's a minor change to a projection, but the rest of the projection is still um, a Mercator uh, cylindrical uh, projection. Using that same projection, we then started looking at um, actual flight data as opposed to just connections um, to the map and 
with our major events um, work and sporting events work um, in Steer, we were looking at ensuring the positivity um, of, of, so we work a lot with the bid commissions for these major sporting events. So this is in particular was the Istanbul um, 2020 Olympic bid uh, that they lost out to Tokyo to. Um, and I was working um, with the team there to produce all the mapping for that bid book. And uh, traditionally, they'd all been using these um, cylindrical projections. Um, and they're fine, but it wasn't really getting the point across that Istanbul was very well connected to the far um, distances of the Olympic Committee uh, and the major uh, players within the Olympics. Um, and so you can see from here that the West Coast um, of the US was looking really um, disconnected to a degree, um, a long, long way away, um, even though it was a similar kind of time to Johannesburg and Sao Paulo. Um, and it's just because of that projection, the way it is really elongated um, across that way. So we started looking at um, how can we highlight this information differently? How can we portray it better to um, better represent the Istanbul as the hub of the world connections um, for flights. So obviously we had a look at all the different types of projections um, that we that are available to us and how could we show that differently and we came up with an azimuthal equidistant projection centered on Istanbul and that really was well received by the um, head of the um, committee that we were working with and when I explained how that works that they're all from that center point that their true distances are shown there to the different places and obviously that's using like a, a great arc kind of theory of where the plane would actually fly directly to from that location um, they really loved it um, and I've been sold on it ever since <laughs> so that's like 10 years I've been trying to bang on about using these this kind of projections so um today i'm going to be showing you so they say this was about 10 years ago when we produced this um where we've now moved it forward to um and getting back to the projection collection ones and how i've produced that so we were working on the um doha olympic bid as well um and obviously there's quite a lot of interest in that with the upcoming world cup um in qatar um and what the flight connections are from there so we had to produce a map in the planning stages for the um that showed the most frequent flights which are the ones that are labeled with a black dot as well and slightly darker green line and then other which are over 500 flights per year and then the other flights which are about um between 50 um and, and 200 um flights per year so one or two a week and this again was recentered now, so you can see, see slightly different from the Istanbul projection there. That's the um, you can notice kind of like Australia and New Zealand on that one, it's slightly higher up, and on this one, it's slightly further down um, projection and recentered on Doha. I'll show you how we did that. Now, if this wasn't centered um, using this equidistant, azimuthal equidistant projection it could look something like this. Um, so this is the same data, and I'll show you in Illustrator shortly um, how that changes. Um, these are using the Great Arc flight, and obviously you can see there the one over to um, California is um, on this one. You're going straight over the Arctic, um, very close to north of Greenland area. Um, and then in this one, that's the same area, obviously it's the same line in the same place. Um, and that's kind of how it would look on that stretched um, projection there and all the other lines. So obviously that just doesn't have the same um, impact. This one obviously shows Rio and the West Coast of America and even Sydney and that of a, of sort of a similar flight time, which they are. Um, whereas this one obviously looks really crazy 
um, and really far and will take a long time to get there. That's the inferred information from it. So um, I will now cut over to the live file and I'll just bring that up separately onto here. And I can go through a little bit about objection. So um, this is obviously the azimuthal projection that we have in here. Um, I have all the map view in Map Publisher. Um, I'm assuming that people who come to this project, this presentation, are familiar with Map Publisher and how that works. If you're not, there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, if you're familiar with GIS and you're familiar with Adobe Illustrator, then the two combine very well. Um, you will be familiar with how layers work and everything in Illustrator. And with the Map Publisher plugin, it just um, assigns every layer to a particular um, point line or area within a particular map view and scale and projection is all held within that one map view. So um, within this, nearly all of my layers, all of my map layers that I've shown here as well that I've got turned on, apart from the legend, um, is in my Doha to 120 million scale. Uh, and I've just got a backup uh, Doha Mercator background layer in there that's just a big rectangle um, that will become evident why I've got that in there as well in a minute. So all of my layers are assigned um, those particular things, as I said, the, the, all this data has been imported um, from GIS using the um, normal import button here. You can import shape files, geo packages, KMLs, all sorts of different um, formats. And then once they come in, as I said, they are then um, assigned the particular projection. Now within here, I'm just going to go through a little bit more about the actual projection and how I've changed it. So within here, you can see that um, this is where we, well, just by double clicking on that, it pops up with this screen. You can see here, we can either move the actual art, art around within that projection. And that's not just moving the artboard around like an illustrator, this is actually retaining all the geography like a GIS. It's more about just moving the baseboard um, from there. And we can also change the scale, we can rotate. Um, and then the important bit down here, this is where we can change the coordinate system um, that we, when we import data. So we can um, assign coordinate systems if a coordinate system hasn't been assigned to something, if it's a, a CSV and the data has come in raw and it needs to be assigned to a WGS or something, then you can assign it from there. But the real power of this um, particular aspect is by performing a transformation with the coordinate system here. So if I click form coordinate trans system transformation and then click on here that and it will bring up a pop-up box to show me all the different coordinates and systems that are available. I can now choose a different coordinate system to swap it out for. So um, as you can see from this original bit up here, it's a grayed out now, but it was the Doha Lambert um, equidistant one that it was before, which is this one here. Um, and I can change it. Let's just change it for um, a World Mercator one for now, just to show you what happens. Um, so I just click on that. I do OK. It will then rescale to fit the artboard. Um, so I'm just going to overwrite that 20 uh, million in there. So it's about a similar scale to the um, existing, or well, same scale um, as the previous version that we had. I've just dragged it down a little bit because obviously it gets very tall like that. And we'll do it from there. And then if I do an OK, hopefully you'll be able to see, move this over slightly, how this changes um, the information here to something very different. I'm just going to drag it over again. I'm just doing like that. 
and it will move it up to there. So you can see here how this is where all these lines go a bit crazy and all over the place. And the background um, ocean has gone all funny because it's trying to work out where to put it from there. So that's why I had that um, background layer um, that was in the Mercator projection just to turn on in the background as a reference. So you can see now um, we've got, I'll just zoom out. Sometimes these funny things happen like this, where you've got um, where the border was before to um, Canada and America and Russia. And sometimes because of that land kind of changing, those sort of bits of land need moving over there. That's gonna be off my artboard anyway, so I'm not bothered about where that goes to too much. Um, but so there's sometimes some slightly unique things with the data that you just need to keep an eye on for that land data. This is all natural earth data. Um, and I'll go through where that data's come from and what that is shortly as well. Um, and you can see here, obviously, the exaggeration with the um, graticules um, and grid lines from there and how that works. So we can then go back, um, click, double click on here. Um, hope you can see this all okay still. Yeah. Um, and transform it back again to the original Doha version. If we do it onto a normal Lambert azimuthal equidistant, that will be centered on zero, zero. So the equator and the Greenwich mean time. Let's try that one for a change. Um, and to scale. Um, I've done something wrong. Um, okay, let's put an extra. Um, let's all go scale. What's happening now? I have these kinds of things. It doesn't look like it's quite going to work, does it? Because it just looks a slightly different thing. But let's click it and see what it does. Yeah, the scale is clearly not working there. Let it undo. That's one good thing about Illustrator. And click on here again. Transform this. Let's do the Rio one into something that should take you right over again. And now this will um, project it with. Rio being at the centre of that, um, I say squished globe, it's not squished globe, but the, the re-transformation um, with Rio in the centre there. So that straight line between Rio and Doha is obviously still a straight line because now we're centering it on Rio and anything that comes out of Rio, but all the other ones are not um, coming out of this mate straight point here. So they're not, um, they're not going to be straight lines anymore because they're going around with the projection. So how do we actually create a new projection? That is what I'm going to show you now. So I'll just go back to the presentation. Um, this is where I've talked about duplicating an existing projection in here. And then we're going to talk about the actual how you get the coordinates um, for that new location. So has anybody got a suggestion of a city that they would like me to centre the map on? I'm starting to so that you can see what I'm going to do. Anybody got a suggestion? Yeah, there's a couple in the chat. So Helen said Hanoi and Jim has said Vancouver. So uh, take your pick. Oh, let's do... Um, we do a lot of work in Canada, so I'm like, yeah, let's not do Vancouver. Um, to, um, not sick of Canada. Obviously, it's a beautiful place. Um, but let's let's try Hanoi. Um, OK, brilliant. Thank you. So we will. So all I've done now is just gone into again to get that um, window up, form coordinate system transformation, click on that um, link below, and then that gives us this um, coordinate system box where we can search things. So in here, we have all of the projections that you could ever wish for, all the projected ones, um, all your recent ones always pop up here, which is why I've got those ones in there. Um, and 
if you want to search for other ones, um, then you've got all these written down here as well. So I'm just going to stick with my um, Lambert as a move thought equidistant projection. And I'm going to copy at the bottom here. So you'll see here there's um, new objects, delete objects, edit, view info, and copy object. So I'm going to copy that object first. The pop ups keep coming up on my other window, so I just need to drag it across. And then in here, when you've done the copy, it will say, do you want to um, rename this one? So I'm just going to um, get up. Just going to Google, make sure that I spell Hanoi right. Um, is how you say it, Hanoi, correct? Um, the capital of Vietnam. Hanoi, so I've just added that to the beginning, so it would be the Hanoi, Lambert, Azimuthal, Equidistant, that, um, the same from there. And then we can OK that, and it adds it as a new um, one at the top here. Just looking, because I don't know where the other one's gone. But it was a, we copied it in the first thing with that. Or did I just overwrite it? Mm, I'm going to close and not say... What do you mean about saving? Let's just go back. I'm just looking because just to make sure that I didn't have it saved any. Well, we can amend it anyway. Let's all right. Love live demos. Um okay, it's still there. Okay, so we can look at the info from here. I think you can double click or you can click info here, and you get the um definition and the parameters and the values up here. Um no, it was a, a I just was worried that it had copied the Doha projection um, instead of from a plat from a normal, like the original projection. It's always better to go back to the original and copy from there rather than something you've been sort of messing about with or um, defined differently already. So, um, yeah, this is fine because it's all got the zero ones. So if we just OK that um, and we were going to change it to that and OK, and this again is... I'm not 100% sure that that's going to be right again. It's like it's going to go weird. Yeah. I'm going to go back to when it was here. Actually centered on Doha rather than moving it around the world um, 10 times before we transform it. So, just again, perform transformation, go to here. Um, this is the Hanoi one. And then what all we need to do, she says, it's still not looking right, is it? I'm going to start again. This is the live, the good thing about all these different ones. I'm going to copy from here again. And let's call it Hanoi 2. Who loves version two? So let's not call it final. That's the, the definition of uh, everything that's going to go wrong there. Uh, here. And then we can put in our uh, origins um, for the latitude here. So if you just Google Hanoi coordinates, Google very kindly puts things even before you've even hit return um, in here. And we can then use these numbers here to reassign that projection onto that particular location. So the first one, um, so we're looking at northeast here um, within the projection. So we know that um, it's in the same quadrant as Doha. So we're looking at north of the equator and east of the meridian. So for a start, we want 21. So just copy that one and paste it into the latitude one here. And that's a positive number because it's going north and then east. And then likewise, the um, east, 105, copy that and put that in the longitude on here. And if we OK that, we should then hopefully get that working right and it will whiz us around to the other side um on the far east so let's save that change yeah we're doing some custom systems 
from there. That projection's looking a bit better, isn't it? What do you do? Okay, scale, put it in there. Okay, fingers crossed. There you go. So now we've got that. So we'll just, I'm going to turn on that background layer again, um, just so you can see the artboard, um, because I've got white land masses. Obviously, it's not very easy to tell. Um, and I don't think we had a Hanoi, the Doha, like them. Um, I don't know if there's a, if the international airport, what the international airport is called, or I don't do any maps of Vietnam, unfortunately, in my, um, we don't have an office there, <laughs> line of work. Trying to see what the place this one might be. Somewhere around here, that one? Where's that? Noi Bay International Hanoi, there we go. Right, okay, so that one there should be the one in the middle of our projection and that line to Doha would be the straight one and then all these other ones occur um, from there so hopefully that's what's happened there and then these ones start to curve out away from it so any questions on how to create your own coordinate system um, I've got that sort of listed in the um, presentation, which I can share again, some screenshots of those things. I can put them on Twitter and um, those where you, where you put those numbers, the Eastern and Western as, as an example. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the final part of that bit of the um workshop and then we've got um a little bit of time now until quite a lot of time nearly an hour still to go through the map styles and um themes from there if anybody else i'll look at the at the chat claire can i ask a question yes what's your favorite projection this one definitely definitely <laughs> why is it your favorite i just I just think it with a simple little change like that, the um by centering on those one points, it gives such a different view. And I mean I suppose it's the same with lots of different projections, that with one change of a projection, it gives you such a different um way of looking at the world and bringing those things together. Um and that one was just it was so well received by the client when we were working on it, um, that I just thought. You know that's that it exemplifies the reason as to why we do these things with projections and why projections are so important that um it tells it it tells the story better than it could ever done um on a Mercator um or on a cylindrical projection um yeah so any any equidistant uh azimuthal one i like that's on, on a particular point and i try and um try and use it as much as I possibly can in, a, in our work to do some flight mapping. So, that, so yeah, makes it more straightforward. Thanks. What I really love about this, sorry, I'm in a um, busy office, so it might be a bit loud. Um, what I really love about this is how you've used the graticules to make it easier for people to understand. I think so often people put graticules on a map and they just sort of sit there because it's the default or because that's that's just how people do it. It's quite... Um, quite standard but they just really really add something here and i think it's such a great use of them so thank you okay. yeah i think it was really uh, so this is the actual um projection collection version that i did of this same so this was obviously using the same data for the doha oh, i was going to go through the data that was the other thing i was going to do before we move on to the other map um was looking at how so i said so i agreed with daniel that i was going to use this particular projection and create a map um for this projection card and i was like how do i make a map that shows this projection off to its best ability but is going to be on a map on a piece of card so you can't see because they put it in front of me that's only this size um and nice and clear so i decided to simplify the information and just show it between 14 and 16 hours so that you got that feeling of these are all the same all very similar lengths and how that changes 
And by adding the graticule lines on there really helps to explain sort of the coverage and that it is the whole globe and you're not just seeing one side of the globe. Sometimes it can get a bit confusing. People think, oh, this is something and they're just seeing half of the globe or they're seeing a view of it from that side because there are projections that are like that. But then, yeah, it's just it's because that blue background on there was placed in Illustrator. Um, that's not the actual ocean because it's very circular. Obviously, that's a bit of a graphic design thing there. The, the graticules were placed via Map Publisher, so they're very they're accurate to to the GIS. Um, but the blue sort of globe shape around it was added um, by me just to show that rather than it being a full blue background um, to emphasize that um, change I suppose so yeah I'll go through awesome I love it thank you and that's so I, I just changed the the file to um as a, as a test to this is the rio version that i had with that other projection and that's how that would change from there to there um just to prove that it works in case the live illustrator thing didn't work <laughs> in the presentation um just to get an idea but again it, it just shows there that you've got the rio direct route um from doha there that stays the same um and the other ones all sort of change around it it's nice to sort of have a play about and see what happens to the data when you change the projection and, and where it goes from. And obviously with this side, I just chose a new font, the airport font. Uh, yeah, I think it's called Air Sky something. Um, font for the Doha thing to get a more of an idea of airports and um, and flight things. And yeah, and that's all yeah. I'll go through the data now that I used for it because I forgot that I didn't cover that before because uh, earlier in my presentation, but the actual um, air flight data. So I mentioned that at the beginning uh, or earlier on when I was talking about the um, need from the client to show what's connected um, to that city for global events, global sporting events. Um, and Steer actually has a subscription with a company called OAG that will produce a really um, detailed spreadsheet on all the flights um, within certain you can tell them a particular year that you wanted it, so historical um, over the last one or two years, um, or, or even earlier than that, um, if you want to do comparisons. Um, and it will tell you how many flights per week they um, do between those routes. Uh, and we then use that data to um, plot the information. Um, it's not open source, so um, the alternative is to look on open um, air flight data. So there's a, a website called Open Sky that you can access to get um, information from. Um, I had a look yesterday, and that's a bit sad. Acknowledgement again um, of the Edinburgh to Northolt RF Northolt um, route. There's been quite a few flights um, up and down, obviously, um, since the Queen's passing. Um, and there's a private plane. This was um, on the day before yesterday um information but you can you can check um and see all air flight this is an open network um nowadays so if you wanted to it, it'll take a bit of work obviously to, to um collate all that information hence and because we do so much work um with um air travel and um consultation we have a subscription with that particular company that will create that data for us and download it um, obviously, there's lots of ways of, of creating your own data um, from the um, air flight data. And I think there's a screenshot here. This is the um, spreadsheet that we get from OAG um, through that subscription um, in detail with the code, the IA, um, T code, the airport name, the city, the country. And then we ask them for flights from 2019 and 2020 from both the Doha International Airport and the Hamad um, International Airport, and then combine that data as well. So we took that information. Obviously, that doesn't have the coordinates um, and the locations of each airport in it, um, but that data is then linked to the next spreadsheet, which is open data. So this is all airport data, and this is accessible on our airports.com slash data. And you can download this um, spreadsheet yourself. Um, it's updated regularly. And you can then, if you link 
the um, code, which uh, it's column N. You can't actually, there isn't any actually in this one. This is the top of the spreadsheet that I've used. But these are all um, non-international airports and heliports. I mean, it has like um, 30,000, no, I can't remember. I did write down 57,000 records in this um, file. So, but in the uh, in column N there, IATA code, you can then match that to the data um, in column D um, on the, the one that I had before. And you can also get that on obviously the column, uh, the data from the open information as well. Link those two spreadsheets together. And say so this one has the code and it also has the latitude and longitude in rows E and uh, column E and F. Um, and then you're, you join those two um, data sets together and you'll then be able to plot it using the latitude and longitude uh, from there. So that's how we go about creating the data and getting it into Map Publisher in the first place. And then all the base data um, that I've used on the um, on these maps is from Natural Earth. So um, the graticules and geographic lines are available um, at different scales, but I think they're pretty obvious what they are, they're all lines. Um, the land is also available at different scales um, from 10,000 to 110 million, uh, 10 million to 110 million, I think it is. Um, uh, lakes, don't forget Great Lakes, that's something that's often missed out. Um, on the land masses, and you'll miss out the Great Lakes in um, North America. Um, to just double check when you're importing stuff that you've got the positive and negative spaces of land on there. And there's also ocean files on there. So if you wanted to create a particular boundary, um, like I was doing before, then you can um, use the oceans information as well. And that's all available on naturaleartdata.com to download in various different formats um, from there as well. So then with those three bits of data, you chain, get your projection, find out your coordinate system, and then you should be able to produce something like that. Thanks for putting those into the chat, Henry. Can't see any other questions from there. So I will continue with the second part of the workshop, which is about map ba base map styling. So this is something that will hopefully help to improve the workflow in Illustrator. Um, it's ideal for creating multiple styled, similar styled maps. So the example I'm using today is for the Steer office maps, um, produced one recently for our new office in London, um, using a particular um, design style. And they've just recently asked us to produce them for our other offices as well. So I thought this would be a good example to show how we can use something over and over again um, rather than starting from scratch each time and selecting all our styles and even in Illustrator when it remembers things, you're still applying things over and over again, even within your um, palettes and things and having to click on stuff and remembering the process and what you called what things. Um, and hopefully today I'll show you a way of um, improving that workflow when you're producing the same thing, the same style of map over and over again. Um, we'll also talk a bit about um, importing to Illustrator using geo package filters, um, both spatial filters and um, attribute filters, um, using the map publisher style themes um, to their best ability, and then how I've reused all those um, and using templates, Illustrator templates, to create the new versions of the map. So first of all, um, OSM data from QGIS. So this is something that hopefully people are familiar with. I'm going to break the presentation now and just open up QGIS so people can see what's going on. Oh, let's go from there. And let me close that one. Open up. 
and Janice. So I'm going to start from scratch. I'm not going to open up one of my previous um, folders. I've, I've downloaded a bit of this data just as a backup in case it doesn't work. So there's anything weird going on, but I'm hoping to do it from the very beginning. So QGIS. Um, this is where this I use this tool to download bespoke OSM data that we're going to use in the buildup of our map. Um, when you first open QGIS, it's just a, a blank thing and asks you what else you want to do. Um, I just think that this OpenStreetMap tiling thing is the best thing ever um, and it's just so easy to use. Just double click on that, it puts it in and then you can scroll around to wherever you want um, in the world as a reference point to see what we're going to create. So we're going to create the Manchester um, office map. And I'll show you how we do that with this quick OSM um, toolbar, toolbar, tool. So first of all, just go back to the, I have to do a bit of backwards and forwards with this, I think, um, with the presentation because I've got the details in here. So the first one we're going to do, we're going to, we need to download data from OSM. So we've got, um, we need some public transport station points, some buildings, some highways, uh, some roads, basically, some railways, some leisure information, um, so the green areas on it and the waterways as well. So the quick OSM tool now, you can sort of um, put in some preset information in here and it will fill it in down here. Sometimes it's a bit, um, not, it doesn't give you exactly what you want at the end of it, but the, um, you can always type in here the actual query um, that you want. I'm just going to put that on my screen again from here. So, I'll leave my window. So, preset, as I said, you can do um, highways in here, and it will start filling in all the different types of highway parameters that are on in OpenStreetMap. So, this you can specify you only want. Um, tunnels, pa passageway tunnels of, of the highways, or you can only pick out the primary links or the motorway links um, that are assigned in that particular category on OpenStreetMap. Um, so what I'm going to do, actually, I want all of the highways um, in this particular area. I should just be, I can either just leave it like that, or I can just click on oh, I want all of the points in a way. We'll just do the highway streets. There we go. And then that automatically fills in all the different types of streets that are allocated as highway uh, in OpenStreetMap. So you get probably a lot more than what you're ever going to need. Um, but you can, I'll show you how to filter that um, when we import it, but you can create it now. And for the first one, um, I always just do the canvas extent that I've zoomed to. Um, it's not too crazy at the moment, um, probably a little bit big, but we'll zoom in a little bit more for the next one. Um, this is how I build it up. So you do that and then you scroll down and you just do run query and hope it works. Sometimes it takes a little while because it's a large area. And it's just basically downloading that data from the overpass um, API and um, the OpenStreetMap um, runs. That's how you get sort of the API information, how um, a lot of things are. Yay, successful. Um, okay, that's a big relief in a live demo. Actually downloaded the data. And then over here, if I just, um, I'll just move that over to my other screen, so it's out of the way. Over here, you can see it's downloaded all of the motorway. Oh, no, it's only done the motorway links. See? This is what I said. I spoke too soon. Has it or has it not? No, it's done all of them, hasn't it? But it's just called it motorway links. See? Weird. Um, that is all of the highways, isn't it? Let's just change the colour of that so it's a bit more obvious. Um, you just double click on there. People aren't familiar with OpenStreetMap. Um, yeah, so it's downloaded everything, all the highway data there, but it's just called it motorway. Or maybe it's long motorway because it's done highway, motorway, highway, motorway, link, highway. It's just listed everything all together. 
um, but then cut it off. Typical JOS thing. So, um, so that's fine. So what we're going to do from here, it's a scratch layer at the moment, which means it will be deleted because uh, it's just downloading it and kind of holding it. Temporary scratch layer only, it says that. So what we want to do is save that data so that we can import it into Map Publisher. So we're going to right click, export, save feature as. Save thing on here. And the best way I found to download, uh, to save this data for importing into Illustrator later so we can sort of filter it is by doing a geo package. Um, that's fine, let's just do, and then click on here to tell it where you want it to save. Some things that I did earlier. Um, let's do a new, so Q, GIS, OSM, data, Manchester, live demo. Let's call it that so that you know which one we're going through. And then I just like calling my stuff. So once it's it's already in a Manchester folder, we can then just call it OSM Highways. Um, for simplicity. So we just OK that. Hope that it saves. Gives you a scroll bar, uh, progress bar at the bottom there. That's saved. And then it puts it back into the OSM window as what you've just saved it as. So if I just turn everything off, that's just a repeat of the data that I've just saved. And these scratch layers can that you can then delete them. Um, or they'll it will just they'll just um disappear or they'll be removed um because they won't link anymore to the data once you um save the file um or do anything else with it. So I'll just turn that on and make them red again. So you can see them. And then because I did it just to that window to the canvas extent before, if I zoom out, you should then see um no roads around that yeah there you go so it's only downloaded that view that i had with the canvas that's how that works so now that data is downloaded we do a similar thing with all the other data um using that osm plugin so i've done the highways and streets one i also want to download the building data the um railway data the parks and the natural water so Here again, um, I'm it, uh, one here, so it's open book on the screen again. There we go. So water, literally, I think you can put in natural and water, or you can just put in water, but let's try. Um, so you can either type it in there where it does it, or you can put it in here, natural, and then water here. We can say, either the same extent as our previous, now that we've done, now that we've got another layer in here, we can say the same extent as our other layers that we've got, or we can do again, just the canvas extent. So let's do it on the same extent as the previous one so that we know it's consistent and scroll down and run the query. And it should add this information in here. That's it on the next. If anybody's um, doing this alongside me, let me know if they've got QGIS open, if they've not used it before, if they've got any other questions. I mean, I'm not, I use it for a particular purpose for exporting data and putting it into um, Map Publisher and then playing about with it in there. So um, we've got other people on the call that I know use it a lot more than I do that are actual geospatial analysts as opposed to cartographers um, like me. So if you've got any questions, I'm sure they wouldn't mind helping me answer them if you have them. Uh, but yeah, there we go, there's the water layer. You can, and there again, I just download, I only saved the, you might have noticed I did that with the highways one, but I didn't talk about it. I only saved the line work for the highways. I wasn't interested in the um, polygons and point data. And likewise with the water, I'm only interested really in the, for this scale of map that I'm doing, I'm only interested in the poly, yeah, polygons I'm not interested in the lines for the natural water or the points for the natural water, which are probably like um, things. If, it, if it's a canal, um, it's probably a a lock 
or something like that um location so um i'm not going to say those it always gives you if there are those things available it will give you the point the line and the area for that um particular um attribution what did i do then rename 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 there we go so we've got the water for that one um now going to do buildings um this usually comes up with quite a lot so going to do that to the same extent again uh, Claire, there is just one question that Mary's put into the chat about how, can you get OSM data into Illustrator without using without going through QGIS? Not that I've found. Um, you can. It's all through like different GIS ones, really, um, because there's like an an a um, an arc sort of download that you can then export to Illustrator, but then you're not using Map Publisher. So I prefer to download the data directly in QGIS. It's free, it's open software um, as well, QGIS as opposed to like the ARC suite. So I find that accessible and it deals with it pretty quickly. I mean, that's downloaded or has it actually done it? I don't think it has. Um, the other ones it's done pretty quickly for the area that it is. Um, I've done something wrong here. Um, so I would, no, unless anybody knows any different, Helen, have you used anything directly? I think it all comes uh, I just put in the chat, um, you can, there's a website called Geofabric where you can download um, country level shape files of OpenStreetMap from, but the data is predictably massive. Um, my my personal favorite way of getting OpenStreetMap data is from Google BigQuery, um, which is a, Google have basically a massive cloud data warehouse where you can access loads of public data sets from, one of which is OpenStreetMap. Um, so I really recommend looking into that. Um, you have to be able to use SQL, but it's, it's a really seamless way of doing it. But I, I think for smaller areas, this is probably the optimum way of doing it. Thanks, Helen. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, what was I going to say? SQL is not something that I'm familiar with um, enough to download stuff with either. So it's something that um, will be a good learning thing. Um, for us, but this at least this way I know I'm familiar enough with OpenStreetMap to kind of get my head around the key and the value things in OpenStreetMap when I've been adding um, information to select things because obviously you've got to know a little bit about the data to be able to select to know what you you want and what you want to download um, and how it's categorized um, and this. This way of doing it gives me a bit of control over that. And I kind of can see if I'm getting the right query returned to me or not. Um, yeah, right, there's the building ones. So this has downloaded all of the buildings. Again, it's given me some lines and some areas. It's separated red into black. I don't know why I had this yesterday. And the red ones have also, I can just put that above it. Um, I'm also in the black database there as well. So um, I'm just going to export both so that it has both of them, both those things together. Buildings. Move that just you don't have to move all these all the time, but it's just to keep this clear so you can see what I'm using and what I'm not using. Um okay, so far three out of three we've managed to download, which is pretty good. Um railways on. So you can just put railway in there and it should hopefully again just set your thing to 
the area that you want to download and download it. And then we've just got some um, green areas that I'd like to download um, because that's a little bit more tricky on this. Uh, API hasn't worked on that one, so let's just try let's reset the railway in here. Sometimes it's from rail or transport railway. There we go. And this will download all the railways that are all different types of things. And this is actually quite good because we'll we'll download all of this and then we'll uh, import and only pick a particular value that we want to import the data from if it if it will download all of it for us. So. There's different ways of filtering the data either here when you before you download it or when you import it to filter it from there as well. Or then post-production, when you import it all into Illustrator, then obviously you can just delete the stuff that you don't want by through selection or inverse selection. But so many different ways of doing it. But hopefully this will be a new way that people like doing. So we've got our railways. Okay, that, and then this is probably will be useful for the railway stations. So I'm going to call that one railway point. And as I said, there's one example in the Illustrator file that I want to show you. Um, yeah, for the green areas. So, because the OSM data is built up for so many different um, ways and so many different reasons, and sort of the background of the data, where it's come from, and how it's been procured, and you know, the open things, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to just say, I just want all the green areas it's not that sort of straightforward so i found the green areas that i'm interested in um for this particular map are actually under leisure and also land use so i've got some that are under leisure and then park hmm. it's not coming under park under it's not park. well the one that i used the other day for the Leeds version of this, which I was using, is leisure and then park. Let's see if that comes up then. Anything. If it doesn't, then we can obviously use that drop down list as a. Yeah, there we go. So it wasn't in that drop down list, but I've used it before. So it's again, it's helpful to know sort of. You can always look on OSM. If there's a particular thing that you know you want to download by looking at this, you can go on the OSM website and log in with your edit um login and click on the item and see what the reference actually is what the value is on that what somebody's called it and then you can search find it in here um i haven't found a better a quicker way or anything through here to find that because this is obviously just a raster image in the background that you're viewing um but that's how i tend to if i'm really struggling with not being able to select a particular thing that i want um then i'll just quickly go onto the osm website and have a look at the data um in on there with you or platform so uh, i'm going to save those particular ones so those are the you see there just apply those you can see there's some green areas it's selected there but it hasn't picked up this park over here for example on the um, river medlock area here so i'm going to say ah uh, now what you can do as well rather than just saving that separately and then importing them all differently you can select multiple things to download. So this is what I did the other day. So I had leisure and park in here, and then you can add another layer and then you put or here. So you don't want something with a key value of that and something else. You want the key value of that, leisure and park, leisure and then park, or you can also support, uh, select, get it to select leisure and spell leisure and garden that tends to pick up quite a lot and then also remember to change that to all was land use 
and grass. And I'll do that to the canvas extent and see. Oh, no, not canvas extent because we'll, I've just zoomed in. So I'm just going to do that back to the same coverage as the buildings, run that query. And then this should produce, hopefully, all the files that we need at one point downloading rather than doing it all one at a time because it's all coming down from the API over pass. No, it didn't like that, did it? Um, let's. You know, sometimes it just doesn't like doing it through the overpass in the API. So I'm just going to run it again and see if it works. So this is obviously it's pulling down stuff from the website. So I didn't change anything then and I ran it again and it worked. So um, sometimes it's just the API not being able to be connected or something and then doing that. So it's not always what you've done. Um, sometimes it's just the, where the data is coming, feeding through from um, and it's not working. So, yeah, so this one, so I'm going to turn off the hatched one that I had before. And then this one has now hopefully got, it hasn't got that green area in there, has it? I wonder what that is. Um, if it's got a few more, uh, I've turned two on together for that one. Above it, you'll see the extras here. So it downloaded these, the ones that aren't hatched with the extra ones that have downloaded there. Um, and then we probably also want that park area there. So let's try doing another request. Does it remember the stuff from before? Oh no, that's a bit annoying. So, uh, leisure park or leisure garden or land use grass, what we had before. And then let's try doing, I'm sure there's land, another land use one. Quite thing, so I want that, and then values it should show me all these ones. Let's so we had grass already. Um, I might be more to um, meadow. Looks like there's a looks more wooded area that bit there that it hadn't downloaded in it. So forest, let's try that. Um, and query. And then whatever this throws up, we'll use that as an example. Um, and we'll take that into the illustrator and map publisher things. I'm wondering if it's only picking up the leisure ones and not the land use ones there. But let's, we'll explore that. So there's lots of different ways you can obviously get all that data, import it, um, collate it. And let's just call this um, box. Uh, and then we can move forward out of OSM. And hopefully that's given you a lot enough examples of how we download this data and how to save it um, from there. Any other questions, let me know. I'm just going to check on the uh, on the chat if there's anything else. Cool. No, that's cool. Right, okay. So we've got our data now. Um, and I'll show you the original here somewhere. Here go, um, the original map that I produced for the London office. So you can see the styles that we produced um, from there. So this is the aim of the map that we are going to produce today. We want um, the streets mainly all sort of a similar colour. Um, the trunk roots, trunk roots are a slightly different style, a lighter shade. Um, they're all styled at different thicknesses depending on the class of the road. We've got railways in here. We've got some um, station icons. Um, we've got green areas in this dotted hatch style. 
um, we've got waterways, um, like we said, and we've got our legend information um, here, our um, scale bar um, OSM contributors um, information, and then in the centre, the name of the office um, and the location. We also have on this particular one the recommended quieter routes to the office from the northeast, south, and west, um, from the main um, larger um, transport hubs around our new office. So I had this map, obviously, had all its data and its layer and things set up. And when I knew that we were going to be creating, recreating um, this style of map for all these different offices, I made sure that I had graphic styles in Illustrator set up for all of the different um, things that I was using. So rather than just selecting those things and styling them on the fly, I made sure that there was an assigned graphic style for it because that's going to be important for our styling on the rest of the, um, the future maps that we produce. So to create, I'll just open up the Leeds version one that I created. So with this particular um, map, I set up so as you can see hopefully in this top corner you'll be able to see all the map themes that were created using the actual illustrator graphic styles here so first of all you need to create the design and then you save it as a graphic style for that particular road so you'll see here i've got this one in particular i've just um selected is a tertiary which well it's a particular road type and it can be tertiary residential or unclassified this particular one here is a service or, or construction one. Um, select this one at the top here, maybe this one is primary or trunk. So those are all set up so that it's in the graphic styles. And the next part of the um, building up to get this automated is to create a map theme in Map Publisher. So from here, if I select the OSM Roads theme, just drag this onto here. Then you can see here that all of these um, values for all of the different data within that highways layer are assigned a particular style. This is where it's going to crash. This is what I clicked on earlier. I looked at this this morning and clicked on it, and then it, yeah, it's crashed. Oh no, I don't know why styles, style sheets are being funny today. Um, I had this crash this morning when I was testing it out. So there you go, there's a lesson for you all. Um, Illustrator does crash no matter how much workflow things you try and um, back up and, uh, and create. Sometimes it just doesn't like a particular palette that you've opened. I have got to upgrade um, Map Publisher, but my Illustrator should be up to date with everything. So it can't be the fault for that. And it won't be Map Well, unless there's a bug in Map Publisher. 11 needs updating, but that was only last week, and I was like, I'm not going to change things just for a live demo. Um, right, let's try again, and let's hope that by selecting a different style sheet, it's not going to do the same thing. Um, open recent, oh, it's not going to open recent, is it? Because it's forgotten everything that I did. So let's open that from here. I wonder what the record of crash, live crashes are for demos. Hopefully, we don't make that today. Um, okay, so where were we? The themes. So the map theme, I'm going to open up the gardens one instead, just so that it's not going to crash on the roads ones. Um, I don't know. I think it's this one, grass areas. Sorry. Um, so on here, so if I select that it's, this is one of the rules, you can see here that the style that I've selected, and this is where you select your graphic style from Illustrator, and you tell it that you want it to be that particular style. So I'll just set up a new one of these. So let's set up a new roads one, and you can see how it's a little bit of work involved in setting them up in the first place. But once you've got them um, created, then it saves you. And I'll show you when you input the data, it just does it automatically. So um, I'm going to do a new map theme. 
and the new map theme you need to tell it um if you're using this there's different types of themes that you can use style sheets charts or dot density so these are always style sheets that you're you're overlaying your graphic styles on so you can give it a name so let's call it osm highways call it roads before so let's do osm highways um, and then you tell it the feature type that you're going to apply it to so obviously if this is a um the green areas then it'd be an area highways is line etc you can do points and text as well so um it's going to be a line one and do okay it then sits it into this um list up here in the map themes and you can double click on that and assign all the information from it so first of all you tell it which layer you've imported that you're talking about so we're going to say that it's the osm highways line layer that we're referencing and it then looks at all the data within that layer and understands what you're going to start doing the other key thing for this going forward for the template version is to click on um, auto assign so its default is always do not auto assign any layers to the style sheet but the um what i've been doing on these ones now is to auto assign any imported layers to the style sheet that have the same feature type so that's again that's an important part of down of having a process of downloading the data the same way every time so by using the osm um the, the quick osm plugin in qgis i know that the data is always in the same format it's always got the same named headers because it's all coming from osm um if you then start getting stuff from different places um they may have different names different header names and different things like that then that um you'll need to update these style sheets um but the way this works is by knowing that that data is coming from the same place so again if you're always using ordnance survey data then you know that the ordnance survey data is always consistent um where you're where you're getting it from then then it works the same so because you know that the data is formatted in the same way so we click on auto assign for those ones and then we can batch generate the rules here so this batch generate one will fill in these rules part here and then we can assign the styles so we know that we're looking at the highways line that's where it's looking at the data and we look at the attribute and we want to assign the highway type so this is in under highways where it says motorway primary residential etc we load that in gives us all the different unique values here so lists them all down here and then we can set the style so at the moment you can just do it as default all of them as tertiary or whatever for now um we can also select it kind of does it a bit randomly i think for a start um if there's a single one for every different one then it kind of works okay because it will just put it one two three four five is one two three four five and it'll assign it one is one, two is two, three is three, et cetera. But we're going to be reusing a lot of these styles where the expression is um, linked to those ones. So we'll, the different expressions will have, we'll use the style multiple different times. It'll be okay that, and then it, it kind of puts it in and then it repeats it again when it runs out of styles. So it's not ideal for this because then we have to change it back again so i'm just going to keep it simple and just change it to one and then we know when we're finished all of them um but that's another way of doing it there's just two different there's like the um single value mode there or the ramp mode which is yeah changing the different style as you go along um so that's fine so we'll okay that we can add it because that means at least it's going to everything there it's going to style it like this and then we update that what that style is in the next window so it goes back to this one that we had originally um and we can change them in here so anything that hasn't got a value we'll leave that as the tertiary one for now we can have a look at those in a bit you can also um produce kind of in this one like a an alert style so if you color it red or something and just be like oh that's something i need to look at later um I've done that quite a few times on, on on really detailed maps where you're looking at planning kind of things um and need to know if there's something that's unclassified in the osm data and it sort of alerts you as to what's going on um construction i think i have a different name the service one for that one cycleway 
but when so I'm just literally referring to how I've set up this uh I've got Moto one primary um primary pedestrian primary and just going down and selecting propose which have that let's just um I don't think we want propose really do we so let's I'm going to create that's just the default for that and then it'll be different. Residential, secondary, you always do secondary links and secondary and same. Sometimes you do, sometimes you can do it as the one below it. So it's more like it's a really detailed junction. Um, service, tertiary, tertiary, trunk, there, trunk, there, and unclassified. Is the same. Um, yeah, that's actually one. Right. Okay. So now that's as you go through here, you can see that the style for those different ones from the Illustrator styles are assigned to that and it will change everything there. So you can either do OK or reply if you still want to do things. I'm going to do OK. And obviously, you didn't see a change then because it was already sold up. But let me just um, start about the other ones, wasn't it? Let's if I duplicate that layer, turn the original off, make them all the same. So imagine the data came in like that. Okay. And then Hit the RSM highways. I'm gonna, we obviously applying it to this copy one now because I just changed and duplicated it. I'm gonna OK. The good thing is that these are all green ticks still, so it knows that it can still find all these um, expressions. This is what it's looking at highway equals construction. It knows that it can still find it all, so that's all OK. And then I'm gonna do, uh, I didn't do apply, did I? Apply and then it's changed it back. So it's changed it to those styles that I've just assigned there. So these ones are your um, tertiary ones and, and the other ones. And then from there. So by having that theme there and the key thing again, adding this auto assign from here and within our file, we can now, when we import new data into a template of this file, we'll recreate this without all of that work. So um, when you create an Illustrator template file, it's very straightforward. So you just do file. So, so once you've created this map and all those sort of themes in it, you can create a template that will retain all that, those themes in there. So you do save as template. Um, I've got one already set up, so I'll show you. Here, where well, I've saved it. Um, some workshop maps. So, and I just called it 2022 office maps underscore, and it's going to be whatever it is next. So, you just call it, test one there, save it. And as I say, it shows you in your file when you've saved it on the network. Um, I'm trying to drag. There we go. Drag that across. It has this different kind of white icon rather than an illustrator file icon and it just has illustrator template um, written along there so then we want to create a new file using all of the themes that i've built up using the um map uh, the illustrator graphic styles building the map publisher themes um using a new file so you just go new for a file new from template select your template file and do new and it will open up now i left the data in there from the leads one as a bit of a reference but you don't have to have the actual data in there uh, and actually it could get a bit confusing with um your layers and things so i'm going to turn all those off um and now I have in there um, some labels um, from there, so we don't have anything on. So I've got a new file with 
let's pretend there's no layers in there. And I can now just, uh, I'm going to just duplicate my, well, I was going to duplicate base map. But what we need to do first is assign the projection, don't we? So with a new template file, we don't have, all we had before was the leads geographic region and the scale for that particular one for all the data. So with a new one, um, I'm literally just going to produce a new base. Just right at the top. Let's just delete all these and then give it a wrap. Okay, so we've got a new base. We are going to draw just the black base so I can see when everything's imported and what it's against. And um, that's a black base. And then if I import my data, so I'm going to go to, oh, this is my desktop version. Hang on. I did a desktop, but there you go, live demo one. We import our highways. Fingers crossed this works. It's loading the data. It's going to import it. Hopefully everybody's familiar with this with Map Publisher as um, whatever coordinate system you downloaded it in. And I didn't change the coordinate system in, in QGIS before I downloaded it from the OSM stuff. So it's in WGS84, which we can perform a transform um, coordinate system in a bit to um, national grid. So um, we'll just import it as it is, and then we'll do that afterwards. So this is going to load it to the um, map to the artboard that we've um, produced, the, and we can load it onto this one, which is the new one. When you save the template file, you can just leave it as one rather than the, have the leads one on there as well. Um, and then it'll only come up with one thing. OK, that. And then hopefully this imports, and it should style it up because it will recognize all of the data already. So there we have. Rather than it just importing it as black lines, you can see there's some grey and they're different thicknesses and stuff like that. And obviously it's all squished at the moment because it's a horrible projection. But if we click on that one in particular that it's loaded into, that brings us up with this familiar projection um, palette. And we can call that, we're going to change it to the OS. The other maps are one to seven and a half thousand. Um, so I'm going to try and do it at a similar scale to my other maps. We haven't particular, we haven't um, confirmed exactly what coverage we want the client at the moment. So we'll just do it like this. We're going to perform a coordinate transformation here and select. Oh, have I not got? I mean, it should be in there. Okay. Um, just zoom in a bit again. So I'm just going to turn this out for a sec just to see where we're at. Okay. Everybody's followed that. So we've transformed it here. We've scaled it with. No, oh, let's do some of that. Because I don't know that I mean. Right. And we'll see what that looks like. A map view of that is already existing. Of course it is, because that's that one. And this is going to be the Manchester version. Um, from there. Ta -da. Right, okay, so that's now scaled it. Yeah, that's the centre of Manchester, isn't it? With the green road like that. Um, and you'll see that all of the lines have been assigned, pre assigned on the import with all those graphic styles because it's recognised all that data. Yay. Um, the one thing to change, obviously, is it doesn't know where in the data the different lines should be so when sort of before this you might have separated all your different highway types into different layers and then put your motorways at the top and your minor roads at the bottom um, and then the junctions sit underneath if you can see from here all my some junctions sit underneath and some junctions go over the top um, can be useful in OSM if there's a Z value, um, tunnels and, and bridges and things like that. 
generally at this kind of scale map it just looks messy and i don't like it so um my style obviously i know that i've only got these two different colors the lighter um and the darker gray so i'm just going to do an illustrator sort of shortcut to select the same stroke color and then right click and arrange and bring those all to the front so they're all within the same layer again i'm not deconstructing or um messing about with my layer everything's still there and if i wanted to replace that layer do anything else with it it's non-destructive way of working it's literally just bringing all of these colored lines to the top of that layer um, but they're all still in the attribute data um, here and they're all still together in one layer they're not separated out into different layers which were then you know it's a de destructive way of producing this thing so now we have our base map and our, all our highways in here already um we could also import i set up before the geo package the in the live demo one still the parks so i'm hoping that this will recognize we can move it into the right projection in a second it will hopefully oh, i'm wrong out or whatever yeah there. Um, we can move it and bring it over here. So I'm going to pick that up from the parks one and drop it in the Manchester one. It then moves over here. And hopefully, yes, it's put that dotted thing uh, style in. Oops, sorry, it's gone somewhere else. Put that dotted style in because, again, that was assigned via the theme for these grass areas. It's recognized that there's a land use equals grass. Um, property in there and assigned it the park areas graphic style from illustrator um and so that is how we build up the map still got 20 minutes left um i'll just quickly go back to the presentation see if there's anything key, any of the key things that i was going to talk about that i haven't covered in that bit and then maybe take a few more questions um Oh, the import to Illustrator. I was going to show you how to filter in the geo package, which I'll do. So this is the uh, auto assign layers and the styles. It's the final map. Yeah, so there's one other key thing with using a geo package that I wanted to share, which is this. So using geo packages as opposed to shape files um, it can be a bit more rigid in that you're not losing parts of your other shape files. Um, the databases and stuff like that and also um it's just one file um so that's just a lot simpler um but when you're importing using these things it you can allow for smaller file sizes and you can also allow for uh, because you can filter that data um and you can either filter it geographically or you can filter it using the data filter so i'll show you that now um I will just do it in the art board or something so you can see that data clearly. So if I import, so there's several different ways. So obviously, we've got format geo package. Um, let's import this highways data again. We can, or let's in, no, no, let's do something different. Let's do the buildings, and then we'll look at the data that we can kind of um, import. So it's quite a big file. The buildings was quite a lot, you know, not for the whole of Manchester, but um, it was quite a big file. So let's pretend we were only wanting a particular type of building um, than the whole thing that we downloaded originally. So we can use this option here, filtering, using default filtering options. Um, and there's different ways of doing it here. So as I said, you can either do it geographically, which is a spatial filter, um, click on that, and then it'll give you a thing here. And you can either tell it to, um, give it a, an area a latitude longitude if you've got a particular geographic area that you want or you can also use these um see this one yeah map view that you want it to only um download in that particular one or i think it's the next one actually this one vector file. oh yeah you can tell it a vector file so you can tell it the extent if you've got a boundary area that you want to use um And I'm sure there was a layers one somewhere. Maybe it's this one. Probably because I haven't got any layers 
many layers in there now because I've deleted them, didn't I? Um, that you can intersect it with from there. Oh, don't crash. I was doing so well. Taking on too many things at once, looking for what I was looking for. No, it's fine. Look, it caught up with me. Go away, cancel, cancel. Right. Okay, so we're not going to do phrase. Spatial anyway, we're going to do a layer filter. So within here, um, we click on it and it will tell us we can have a look, have a sneaky look before we import all the data, what all the different attributes are that have come in from OpenStreetMap. Gosh, there's so much information. Now, all of that geo, uh, all that of that database information is obviously taking up um, kilobytes in your file um, for the data. Um, it's not really necessary. So you can, you can unclick everything there unclicks everything and you can just say just tell me the building type and what like the name maybe would be useful sometimes um there might be something else that you're particularly interested in the um i don't know the house number i don't know um from those things so you can only so you that's one way of filtering the data that's actually going to come in in the uh, map attributes table which helps reduce your file size you can also click on double click here to specify expression and this will filter the actual um data points that are coming in just my other screen so here so we can now build an expression and hopefully people are familiar with these with the um map, map attribute selections and things already in map publisher if you're not just um sort of message me and i can help with those kinds of basic expression building things. Um, so we can say we only want buildings that are um, churches. So now we're going to import, I hope there are some churches in this, there should be in there. Um, now it's only going to load up the churches and it's only going to load up the building um, attribute, the house number and the name, which is a heck of a lot less data than is in that original GIS one. So we'll do OK for that. OK, again, it's going to import into WGS84 and then we'll move it into the other projection again. Let's do OK. Uh, I'm going to put it on the new artboard and have a look what it looks like. And hold our breath. And let's put something in. Right. So what have we got here? We have 42 pieces of data that it's brought in, all churches and with their names. And then I'll put it in that other map view and it'll just put it on the other art board again. And let's um, colour them up so we can see them. There we go. So now we've only imported, even though that database was really quite large, we covered um, this is all the, the building things originally from OSM. Um, now we've just imported that particular one. So that's a way of filtering the data on import. Um, I also had another example of using code point. Um, so it's a nine megabyte file um, for the whole of London, for the whole of the code point ones and if you knew that you only wanted sw19 for example you could put that um that um reference in that um query builder to not just build not just building equals church like we had but it was starts with and then the column is postcode and the beginning of that information within that column is sw19 whatever and then the other three codes and it'll only bring in that thing. And that was only a 1.4 megabyte file instead of a nine megabyte file for the whole data. And it just, yes, you could have brought it all in and deleted the other things and it would go back to that file size. But sometimes Illustrator can be a bit um, flaky as it can be seen to do the whole thing. So it helps hopefully people to import big data in a more efficient way. Thank you. Right, we've got 15 minutes still. Um, so I'm happy to take any more questions or if there's anything you want me to go through again or anything, then let me know.
Okay, how do you go about labeling features? Oh, yes, okay. Put them in a similar way to how you did with the churches. Yes, so labeling, we, I didn't cover this, did I? Um, we, in Illustrator, yeah, I'll show you the highways here. So um, this is Map Publisher toolbar at the bottom here. I just, I'll get to the bottom of my um, screen. There's a labeling, we have, we have Map Label Pro um, and you can set up all your layers here. So um, it will list what you're gonna label them up here. Again, it's you, you can use the different styles that you set up as you go along to reuse them. So you click highways, lay, highways line there. You're going to label it, so we just need to click on that is labeled, or you can click it down, it fills it in there. You need to tell it the attribute that you want it to label. So we need to do name. Why is I then change it to right at the bottom of the list? When it used to be, I don't know. If anybody knows that reason, then it yeah. Um, and then you can style it here. So these are some ones that I have loaded in already in Map Publisher on my machine. It, these only stay, these don't retain with the file, they only stay on each version of illustrator on people's machines so if it's something that you're familiar with using all the time then that's good because you can use it across all your things but if you're passing it across to somebody else then they won't have the same style um references so we can tell it to um change everything to that style here um you can also use your and that will change everything on there and label it to that style and you you amend the styles by clicking on this little pencil here and you change your different fonts and, and styles and colors and things like that there and um, you can also use your label filters here so you can tell it to um, limit by expression so again it's an expression builder so where highway equals motorway you can use the white version. Sorry, we're doing it. Yeah, I think so. And then, um, oh well, any anything else we'll use. Thing. I'm trying to remember which way around it goes. Yeah, that one. And then anything. I'll apply to all. I can't remember if you do one and then the other. Let's, let's give it a test because I'm just trying to think if the label one filter will overwrite the other ones and then apply to all does everything else. So you've got one that's the exception, which will be in white, and then one that will just be in grey, I think. Just check what colour that will Black. Okay, let's give it a go. Might as well. Um, label that. I don't know if I've got the right art, art board as well, but let's see what it comes up with. Um, and then that looks at that attribute data and places it. There's rules about like how many times you get it to repeat something as well. Um, the log is just going to say that there's too many things going on um, around the artboard. I'm just going to zoom in. Um, and hopefully you can start to see there's some text here. It's the wrong caps and things as well, which you can also amend the case um on things and i've also sat it above the roads which hasn't helped because now it's not sitting on things so um yeah there's lots of things like this that you can set up which just bring it them all down a little bit so hopefully we'll be able to see them a little bit better um yeah there's a whole i'll, sh I'll go through that patrick with you um at some point being still employee um on how you label these streets and um I don't think we've got a, a theme set up for it. But yeah, you can set up, you know, like when we looked at originally and it was style sheet for text. So um, that's where we'd label them up um, and run them and use all those things as well through the Map Label Pro section. Um, what's the largest data you've loaded into Map Publisher? I haven't got a clue, but it doesn't like it. I mean, it's anything over what 50 meg or something like that, it struggles with. Um, so yeah, it's it's just the limitations of Illustrator. 
um, and what it can, how many vertexes it can deal with on the lines. So sometimes it can be a large geographic data set and not many attributes, and that'll be fine, but then or the other way around. So it's the, the, the combination of the database within there and the geographic lines and areas that might have a change. Um, I'm just reading the question, so you see this shown as well. Can you tell us about the benefits of using Map Publisher, what you prefer about it as opposed to other Illustrator and geospatial plugins? Yes, what you're doing here is SQL. That's it. That's the query builder. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm only used to doing it in here, not on other softwares. So um, I find the benefit of, because I work across the teams in geospatial using traditional GIS software and graphic design teams using Illustrator, um, this seems to fit cartographic outputs perfectly using Map Publisher. Um, I'm able to use the data and things that the geospatial team create um, and still export it and produce um, a good looking map and at the end of it, which is becoming easier in some geospatial software. Um, but still not as user friendly in the WYSIWYG kind of format. Um, that I can that I find from here. I mean, it's obviously it's used. I've used this sort of type of software for twenty years, so I suppose it's kind of what I'm used to and how I work with things. Uh, but it does give that flexibility um, of design um, to produce things that are geographically accurate still and have that added power with the projections, like I said, and importing data even though you know there's some limitations over the size of the data can there can be limitations over it but hopefully some of these things have shown people better ways of doing it or ways around it if they're, they're having difficulties with those so yeah thanks Mary yeah as I said it's the illustrator that has an issue with um, the limit of vertices and things that it can uh, import so Hopefully that's been interesting for everybody and giving people some little tips and clues on how to produce different things in Illustrator, um, how to yeah, make the most of anything that they're having to reproduce all the time so that they don't have to keep doing it over and over again um, and make things a bit quicker. <laughs>